giving money to ADRA. Some can be as hard as actually traveling to help refugees. Um, if you want more information about how to help refugees in our local community, you can go to ADRA.org and it pulls up by state what the different activities in the area are. We have a lot of refugees from Myanmar here in our, in our community. Um, and if we talk about going places, um, this morning, um, you've heard me talk about my friend Olin before, who is the sole surgeon, sole physician at a hospital, an Adventist hospital in Chad. His wife is the OBGYN, and his father-in-law is the only surgeon. And the three of them serve a community of more than 200,000. Um, it started out with only about 10,000, but then they had these things, this problem in uh, the Congo. And I don't know if you know your African map very well, but the Congo and Chad are pretty far away. But Chad has agreed to take in a bunch of the Congo refugees, the so Congolese. Nearly two million people from the Congo have been displaced since January of 2017. 4.5 million are displaced within the Democratic Republic of Congo, and 600,000 are refugees throughout the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, including Chad. The Democratic Republic of Congo itself is a host to around three, sorry, 530 refugees, sorry, 530,000 refugees from neighboring countries like the Sudan, the African, uh, Central African Republic, and Burundi, with more coming. So Congo is in the middle of two different things. So missionaries may not exactly be what you have in mind, but Olin's church, Olin's hospital is submitted is supported by Adra, so your money goes to them. This morning I was reading Facebook, and this is um, this is what Olin posted this morning. That time on Sabbath morning, on the way out the door to church, and you discover your two-year-old daughter has put a roll of toilet paper in the toilet, mm -hmm. and then somebody had a giant poo on top of it, mm -hmm. and it plugged up the toilet, and then you plunged it. And the poo juice got everywhere, including your eyes. And then the poo bubbles up in the sink, which drains from the same toilet drain. And then you plunged it, and you plunged, and you plunged, and you plunged, until you heard bubbling coming up from the floor. And your tire started all turning dark colors, and you realized that you had just cracked a pipe that's down under the cement slab. And you realized you'll need to call a plumber, pull up the tile, and jackhammer the slab, and repair the pipe, then re-pour the concrete, then relay the tile, and then you realized that you are the plumber, because none of your neighbors and your 200,000 people have even running water at their home. So why would anybody ever even learn plumbing? And instead, you decide to go on your vacation next week and hope the situation magically fixes itself while you are gone. Yeah, that time. So we may not all be Olin's. We may not all be able to keep the same kind of attitude that Olin and his wife and their four children do. All four of them have had malaria. One of their um, co-workers' children actually died of malaria. Um, but refugees. He has a passion for refugees. He wants to rescue the lost and to save the perishing. So let's stand for our opening song, number 373, Seeking the Lost.
Um, please take out your wallets and they will be looking for the green stuff that you're holding out. We really do thank you so much for your generosity during this offering, our children's ministry offering, because this is the only thing that funds our children's ministries here at the church. So we thank you so much.
That's right. God raised him up high, didn't he? Sometimes the path there is not easy for us, but when we are kind to others and we show kindness and loyalty, God will carry us and he'll stay right next to us. Isn't that cool? So even when it's rough, he's still walking with us and helping us all the way through. Oh, see, I'm getting the service. <laughs> <laughs> All right, does anybody want to pray for us? Nobody wants to. You want to pray? Oh, you pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this building. And, um, thank you that today is Sabbath, your holy day. And um, please thank you um, for everybody in this building and help us all to have a good weekend. Amen.
of all the family members around her. Send your Holy Spirit, Father, to be with us, giving us hope, protecting, and strengthening us when we are weak and also healing the sick. Lord, we ask you to grant us peace, peace in our homes, peace in our church, and peace in our hearts. We see the happenings around us and in the world. All these show that your coming is very, very close. Help us to stay focused on you and only you, Father. There are so many needs and wants, but only you are enough for everything. You are powerful and your power is great. So in your name I pray and believe. Amen. Here's the issue. 
If we don't meet the budget, it's very difficult to plan for next year. It is one thing if the cost of keeping the church open is decreasing, but it's not. It's increasing, especially the insurance. So how do we plan for next year's budget if we can't even meet the current budget? That's a challenge. Here's another challenge. We actually, depending on how we're going to end this month, if the deficit is, the, let's put it this way, the treasurer cannot close the book unless he has the reserve to be able to close the books. Or if we, our shortfall is greater than the reserve, we're in trouble. And I hate to say this, our reserve is pretty thin. Comparative of our budget, it's less than a month. So I'm calling this with seriousness, not seriousness. I, I also want to thank for all that has given monthly, systematically, thank you, thank you, thank you. The treasurer was telling me there are 56, 55 that gives both systematically church budget and tithe. Thank you very much. And for those who haven't given towards the church budget for a while or haven't ever given, Will you please be extra generous this month? Help us to meet this budget. This money for the church budget is the only thing that is designated to keep this church open. So I ask that you please be extra generous this month. Help us to meet the budget. If you have any questions about the finances of the church or can't understand certain things, Ask one of us, the, 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 the finance committee, that's Angie, Jim Simmons, myself, Michael, Pastor, Fred Beeson. We're happy to answer any question. Tell us, talk to us. Okay? Thank you so much. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you so much for giving us this building, a place where we can worship you and we can come and gather each Sabbath. Lord, you know our challenges in our finances for the church budget this month. But we know that this is your house, this is your church. Touching each one of our heart to be extra generous this month and bless the funds that we collect for your purpose and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
worship with us here today. I'm seeing familiar faces, and I've seen some new faces out in the crowd. And I just want you to know that we are thoroughly blessed to have you here today. And what a blessing. We like to give ourselves a spiritual challenge every month. We change it up every month. Here's our spiritual challenge for the month of June. In difficult moments, ask yourself, what would love do? And do it. And don't give up doing it. Why? Live what you are intent on learning. Live what you are intent on learning. And love is the lesson of life. Amen? Amen. All right, we're so excited. Thank you for that detailed um, description of our finances. The finance committee works very hard on this, and it's time every year. It's tough because a lot of us are traveling and doing our vacationing uh, during the summer when we land this at the end of every June. God has blessed us for years uh, in you making ends meet, so thank you so much. I'm looking forward to seeing the miracle take place as we reach 100% of what we're, we're pledged to give, all the areas that need it. So thank you so much for your help. For those of you who are visiting us today, we're in the middle of a sermon series uh, where we are beholding the character of Christ. Because we know that by beholding him, what happens? You cannot help but be changed if you behold him. It's not like it might happen, but if you truly behold the Son of God, we will be changed. And I want to be changed. How about you? One of the things we're noticing as we look at the characteristics of Jesus is that there's way more than we thought was sitting right there in front of us, uh, very deep within the stories that are told about him in the Gospels. And today's emphasis is kindness. Um, we also have been tracking a children's book related to this in our children's uh, story time. And we have kind of a color by number picture of Jesus that we're adding a color to each week. If you want to play with this, even as an adult, you know it's all the thing to kind of just do a little, little de-stressing to play with that. And why not, why not Jesus? Why not? So we have this blown up in a bigger form if you'd like it. We'd like to give it to you. Or if you know a shut-in or someone who would have fun following along online when they watch and participating, it's a wonderful thing to bring to them if you'd like to make a visit and uh, bring this. We have those. We have more at the back if you need some. It'd be a wonderful thing. And kindness, we've just assigned the color blue. We're so glad you're here today. May God richly bless us as we continue to worship him. I pray that he will anoint you with just what you need to hear today. Oh, you 
that's been going around. Have you ever been one to be blessed by? You've heard about it. Oprah talks about it. Everybody talks about these random acts of kindness. Have you ever had that happen to you? I've had it happen to me. Doesn't that feel good? Now, were you the one um, that sometimes now that it's so popular now, they'll say to those in line, now, would you like to pay it forward? So you say, sure, and then you pay for the one behind you, and you wonder how long the line goes, you wonder how far it goes along the line. Or you're just like, no, I'll take that, please. It's been a rough week. You have seen a little bit of kindness. I wonder if anybody says that. I wonder if anybody actually says that. Or if they don't ask, they were just counting to see how many would on their own pass it forward. Random acts of kindness. Now, we know our society needs that kind of thing, so it's a good thing when these things happen randomly, people you don't know. Because you were just sitting in your car not wanting to interact, but the interaction came to you, and you felt blessed from it, and you drove away saying, huh, random acts of kindness. I should be more kind in the world. That felt good. Strangers. That's a good thing. But you know what I know for sure? That is just a fraction. That is just a tiny little piece of the kind of kindness God knows how to give. That is just, that is just like nothing. That's like minuscule. Come on, people. Job is suffering. He's lost his family. He's lost his life. He can't even stand to live right now because he's got boils all over his body. Some of you have been sick this summer. You know what sickness feels like for a minute. And, and he is just down and out. You ever been that devastated? And I know a Starbucks coffee would feel good in the moment. And that kind of kindness, that level of kindness. But I'm just saying you can't even stomach that today. That's not what you need. You need a different level of kindness. So your Father, help us with your kind of kindness. We need your kind of kindness. I just think about the kind of kindness I like to throw out to people. I do my best job at kindness. What, how do you throw out kindness to people in the world? You know, a smile when you didn't feel like giving them one? Kind word? What kind of kindness do we know how to give? And even that, even our best effort at kindness in the world is a fraction, a fraction of this kind of kindness. I want to know, Jesus, how you demonstrate it. You know the Bible talks about kindness a lot. I encourage you to go in the, in the Word of God, and this word that we throw around like it's nothing, just to be kind. It's just like a, it's not like a magnificent word. It's like a lightweight word. We throw it around all the time. But it's thoroughly, thoroughly spread through the Word of God. Thoroughly. Thoroughly. Let's look at what the dictionary says about kindness. The quality of being friendly and considerate. Synonyms, warm-heartedness, affection, gentleness, concern, care. We think about friends, those people who are our friends, and you can list their names. They're usually people who do this for you, this amount of this for you, or they consider you their friend. It's because in general, you're not me. So you get to be on the list of friends. You're not mean, and you're in general friendly, and you're kind of considerate. I mean, I wonder when we like people, now friend and how you qualify friend is different today than it even used to be. You do that on, you do that on your phone now. Who are your friends on your phone? And what do they have to do to become your friend? Well, some of you have a hard time just unfriending people and you're just like collecting a long list of friends. I've got 346 friends. So all you have to do is hit, you know, like, I like you. You're friendly, you're considerate. You like my posts, so I like you. What does it mean to be a friend? What, you know, it's just finite. Dear Father, teach us your kind of kindness. Teach us, because, because we need to know it. In this world, we're starting to research the impact of all of this internet depth of friendship, depth of kindness that we get in. It's so shallow. I mean, we like it. It feeds us on some level because we want drive-through friendship. That's what we want. We want to go through the drive-through. We don't really want to get out. We don't really want to do it. We just want to feel like we have it on the side when we need it. Right? And so we're studying this as a society. We're saying it's not as going deep with each other. Father, 
other help. Other help. Job goes on to say, you gave me life, Lord God. Let me think about your kindness, God. I'm sitting here wallowing in the pit of despair of a life that's hurting, but I'm reminded when I really ponder this for a minute, you're the one that gave me even thoughts to have in this moment. You gave me life and you showed me kindness. Job can say that after all he's been through. That is a God who has reached down and been there for Job in the worst part of his life. That he can still say this in Job chapter 10. I want to know that kind of kindness, Lord God, that meets us in the worst part of where I need it. Worst part. Worst part. Father, help teach me. Titus, chapter 3, 4, and 5, is the point. But before we get there, hold that thought and open up your Bible to a story. You've heard this story a bunch of times, but I'm loving Luke today. Open up your Bibles to the book of Luke. So we're going to the Gospels where Jesus is doing some things. He is on this earth. He is living out kindness. And we have this incredible, cool story that relates to so many of the texts on kindness. Because kindness is not a word that's trivial in the Bible. And it's always attached to the biggest act that God could ever offer us in the, in the story of kindness. And kindness is not just offering a pay forward of five bucks in the fast food line. It's big. God's kind of kindness. And when he defines kindness, it's not just uh, being cordial with the family of God. Jesus looking down at all these people wallowing in our own pain or wallowing, we lost everything, we can't see straight forward. He's just not being cordial in it. He's going deep. He's going deep into it. So, verse 1 says, When Jesus had called the twelve together, all the twelve to say he called the disciples together and he numbers them twelve. I'm gonna see this pop a lot. Luke is he's talking about some things today. Alright, he gave yeah. in chapter nine. I'm gonna go back to chapter eight. But Jesus is calling the twelve, verse one, and he gave them power and authority to do some things in verse nine. So he wants his disciples to know power and authority in this realm of kindness. But jump back now to chapter 8, verse 40. Jesus has been healing demons, doing, doing different things, and the legion and the pigs in the last story. Now, Jesus returned from doing all that, and a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. So a crowd there see Jesus coming. They expect that he's coming. And they're waiting. They're anticipating. And sure enough, he comes. And in knowing that he's going to be there, verse 41 says, Then a man named Jairus, uh, just so we know, this is not just any old man. This man is a ruler of the synagogue. So he's a holy man. He, he's in charge of church in this. He's charge of of what Moses told them to do for all things salvation. And this man knew Jesus was coming, and he meets them there. And when he sees Jesus, he comes, the Bible says, and he fell at Jesus' feet. This is a big deal, because not all the religious leaders we know gave Jesus the time of day. They felt a little threatened by him, but this man has a need that's bigger than um, the general kind of kindness that he knows in the synagogue. And he hears about Jesus, and he runs to Jesus, and he falls at his feet. This is a reputation issue for him today, but when you're in that much need, you need a different kind of kindness, and you're willing to go there. He falls at his feet, and he begins pleading with him in front of this large crowd. He came to him, and he began to say, hey, listen, Jesus, please just come to my house. Because my only daughter, my only daughter, the Bible says she's about 12 years old. She's dying. My only daughter. He needs something bigger than what he 
knew how to get any other place in the world. And he had heard that Jesus could do things, and he went and he, he gave it his all. Please, can you just say it? Jesus is going to respond to this need. He's not just casually polite about it. He's going to go help. Jesus went on his way, and the crowds almost crushed him. Crowds were there to see Jesus. They had been anticipating that he's coming. They were waiting. He finally came. This man came and pleaded one of the upper echelon in society. Now Jesus is going to go to his house, and the crowd's not going to let him go. So they almost crush him, trying to follow him wherever he's headed. Over there, the Bible says, in the middle of this hyper-crazy moment, crowds crushing him, and he's trying to follow and help this man who's pleading in agony, because there's a 12-year-old girl somewhere over there in the house trying to live, and she's not making it. But the Bible says, in the middle of this miracle, another thing gets in the way, on the way. A woman there, who had, some Bible version said, an issue of bleeding. This one said was subject to bleeding, had an issue of bleeding for 12 years. There's that number again, 12. That's curious to me. 12 long years, that's a long time to be dealing with that issue, family of God. We don't want to go too deep, but that's a long time. We're talking about a woman who's dying because you lose that much blood, any doctor knows any kind of losing of that much blood, you're anemic, you're not living much longer, you can't sustain this much longer, 12 years, and she knows it, and she knew Jesus was coming, she, if you go to the book of Leviticus, and I'll just send you there if you'd like to, Leviticus chapter 15, you'll see that whole story, because Leviticus starts talking about how, how this thing that happens, you know, the Bible and God is clean, God is a God of clean. He likes clean, and he doesn't like disease, and he likes life and living. So Leviticus is full of descriptions of how a society can live together, be close to each other, and be orderly and clean. And when these kind of things are happening that were happening to this woman, she was unclean, and she had to stay out of the space of people in large crowds. And even if clothing in her vicinity was touched, it was tainted and unclean and needed to be washed. So it's very thorough and how that is. So she knows she shouldn't be there, but listen, just like Jarius, she's desperate. She's desperate for deep kind of kindness that can fix this thing. She's dying. She's dying. And she knew that of all her years, 12 years, she had been trying, just like Jarius was probably thinking, I have no place to go. She too was saying, no one else can heal me of this. No one else can. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Okay, that means he's going to be unclean. But she just knows somewhere in her heart, when you do that kind of reaching and stretching, you are full of hope and you are full of desire and you just believe like Jerry's believed, had hope. I don't know what it was about the Son of God, but he instilled hope that, that his kindness does something. And she reaches out, and she just touched the edge of his cloak. That's as far as she's going to get in this crowd that's crushing Jesus on the way to heal another young girl that has more life ahead of her than she has. And the Bible says that when she just touched the edge of the hem of his cloak, her bleeding stopped just like that. And I didn't know that thing, but she had energy all of a sudden inside of her, and something happened to Jesus for even though he was pressed in by the crowd, and is on the way to a different mission, he stops in the middle of the crowd and asks a question. This is the beginning of deep kindness. He could have kept walking in the crowd on the way. But he stops to say, who touched me? Jesus asked everybody, and all the other ones denied it, like they felt a little accusation on that end. I didn't do it, I didn't do it, but I didn't do it. And then Peter said, Master, People are crowding and pressing against you. They're crushing you. Everybody's touching you. Everybody's trying to touch you. But her, her reach out was different. And something happened and Jesus said, but, but this someone who touched me, I know. I know because power went out from me in that moment. That's really cool, isn't it? That's 
really cool. Because you can touch Jesus, you can brush beside Jesus and get nothing out of heaven out. Doesn't that hurt a little bit? That hurts a little bit, family of God, because we're trying to brush by Jesus all the time. And you can get nothing out of it, you get nothing out of it. But this woman, she barely was, even she was wanting to do the fast food version of it because she didn't want to be seen today. She's already known as unclean, and that's not going to go well. And she wants her miracle, so she's pressing in in spite of what they might say. So she's trying not to cause a scene. And she luckily, luckily, I don't know how, she had to push her way through that crowd to get to even the cloak, even to the hem. And she gets to the hem, and Jesus knows power left her, him, and power went into her. And she was healed immediately. Something beautiful in the transfer of kindness took place that day for this woman. It's a beautiful thing. And then the woman seeing that she could not go unnoticed now because something happened at the window. Would you like me to pay for the debts of all your sins? Yeah, that would be nice today if that miracle took place at this window. She could not go unnoticed when Jesus said, I want to know who. I want to look you in the eye. I want the whole crowd to see the one that got something from touching me today. I want to name you. I want to elevate you. I want to put you in the middle and lift you up. You've been hidden. You've been shamed. You've been called unclean, but now you're healed and you're new. And I want to give you not just healing where you slink away and become something in your own private time. I want to elevate this moment in front of everyone because it will complete your healing actually to be seen and to be known and to be named here today. And, and when she reveals herself, because she knows she cannot go unnoticed, she came trembling and she fell at his feet. And in the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him. And I bet they all went, <gasps> And how they relieved themselves in their side because how she had been instantly healed now at this moment. And then he said to her, Daughter, daughter, that felt good too. I see you as daughter. You're mine, you're of me, you're cherished by me, you are special, you're not unclean, you're my daughter. Your faith has healed you today. Go in peace. And Luke is not messing around when he uses this word faith at this moment. It comes up again. And that number 12 is very curious. When I saw that listed twice like that, huh, the little girl is 12 years old. 12 is interesting. I remember when Jesus was 12, what was Jesus doing at 12 years old? He started teaching, he took teaching all the big guys down at the temple. He started going to church. When he went to church, he was teaching the big guys about scripture. At 12, things happened. At 12, there were 12 disciples. There were uh, 12 sons of Jacob. There were 12 tribes of uh, Israel. 12 shows up a lot. 12 times 12,000 is 144,000 that end up representing church. 12 represents the family of God. The New Jerusalem comes in numbers of 12. So even the city that the family of God lives in, it's a complete holy number, this beautiful number 12. It's a number of perfection. It's a number of institution. It's a number of government. It's like how I'm going to govern this place is like kindness you have not seen yet. The order of things in this number 12. And this young girl at age 12, what happens at age 12? She starts to become a woman about that same time. How interesting. Her flow begins to happen at this point in time. Just as this older woman with hormones starting to change, her flow becomes a different thing at that stage of the game. But both young and older woman, they're dying if it weren't for Jesus. The other thing about women, it's interesting that they're women in this illustration because female also represents church. Equals the number 12. Oh. I just started exploding with holy amazingness and like, Luke, you are so cool. And your meaning making and your tying together of all these gods. And church, now that 
they've met Jesus and his kindness is going to change. The woman of the flowing blood, blood is a thing too in scripture, isn't it? Blood, let's talk about the blood. Blood of Jesus is going to be shed for all of us and for his church. Something had been happening in the church prior to Jesus, which is the woman, older woman. The older woman represents the church thus far. When you go to church thus far, Jairus represents church too, church synagogue. So interesting, so interesting. So old church, church to this far, reaches out to touch Jesus because nothing could yet heal them even though blood was flowing every time they went to church. Every time that they came to church, they had to bring sacrifices and offerings and they had to slay the, every creature under the sun to make up the difference for their sins and even though this was supposed to jolt them awake to say, I will do it no longer. I will be kind going forward to everyone I know. But they weren't. This flow of, of sacrifice and blood through animals was not working. Nothing could heal the older woman flowing with blood. But the blood kept coming and kept coming and they were dying. The old church was still dead until they touched the hem of Jesus' cloak. And immediately the church of old will be healed. Amen. And the blood would stop flowing once the sacrifice would be made. The blood would stop flowing and they would be healed in the name of Jesus. Wow, this is cool stuff. So he says, daughter, it's no longer the sacrifice of the animals that save you anymore, but your faith in the sacrifice has healed you today. It's time for a new covenant with my church, with my people. Go in peace. Go in peace. But the miracle's not done. The miracle's not done. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus. They're going to deliver a kind message to relieve Jesus of his of his assignment today. That's our kind of kindness. He came from the house. Jesus is still saying, go in peace. He's making this amazing announcement, pronouncement, announcement of, of the church that's going to be his major thing. And while he's still speaking, a man comes from the house of Jairus. He did not let anyone go. Wait a minute, I'm ahead of myself. And he said, from the house of Jerry's, the synagogue ruler, that guy who started the whole thing, he says, he makes a big announcement in front of all people, your daughter is dead. Too late. Twelve-year-old daughter's dead. So he says to Jerry's, don't bother this little teacher anymore. This, this teacher who just says nice and kind things and teaches you cool ideas. Don't bother him anymore because your 12-year-old daughter is dead now. She's not going to live forward into her womanhood years. She's not going to move forward. The new church has no hope. She is dead. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, because he could see the look on his Despite the fact that he just saw the miracle of this woman right here and all the hope that was bubbling up, all the truth that Jerry should have been connecting the dots because he's a synagogue leader, but he is too devastated by grief right now because he just was shocked and not into hope with the last story, but shocked into grief at this moment. His daughter has died. Don't be afraid, Jesus says to him. Don't be afraid. Look at me. Look at me. Just believe, Jerry. Just believe. This is a new day and a new covenant. Just believe. I wonder if Jerry was thinking about all the sins he had committed and how it was coming down on his daughter. I wonder if he was automatically thinking, what should have I done? What offering should I have brought to church? How could I have fixed this? How much of this is my fault? Don't be afraid, Jerry. This is a new day and a new covenant. Look into my eyes and just believe. And she will be healed. Jesus speaks these words, conviction comes on the soul, and they start going to his house anyway. I 
when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, because she had already died, guess what's standing outside of the house? A ton of people. Doing what a ton of people do when someone dies. They're wailing. Crying, making a big fuss. Whoa, just grief. You want to share your grief when you love someone. And so they were both of people. Some of them were hired to do that. You have professional criers back in the day. Wailers wailing just because that meant, and this was a high official. So, so these were, he would have had a lot of wailers there because that just meant how loved and how special you were as a group of people. This wasn't a quiet daughter of someone unspecial in some little house over there that no one knew. This was the daughter of Jarius, the synagogue leader. And they are wailers outside crying because his, son, his daughter is dead. Jesus arrives at the house. The Bible says he goes in with a small group of people. And the people are wailing and mourning outside. And Jesus is trying to do a miracle here. And so he, he comes outside. And in his kindness, sometimes kindness needs to confront a thing. See, when we do kindness, we do kindness, we need to do kindness that's reciprocal. You ever notice that? Our level of kindness is a reciprocal kindness. I give kindness because you were kind to of me. Or I'm going to give you kindness because I help you then be kind to of me. Or it just kind of flows like that. And if suddenly you're not kind to of me and you share the little harsh word, oh, I consider my kindness towards you now. I adjust that just a little bit. A little kindness towards you that way. But Jesus' kind of kindness is focused on not this reciprocal change of the same way. His kindness is different and sometimes it's kind to confront a thing, to wake us up to the point of a thing. And so he goes out and he says, and I wonder how he said it because Luke doesn't describe the tone of his voice, but if they're wailing and crying and there's a big group of them, I think he has to raise his voice a little bit to stop it, otherwise it can't be heard. I wonder if it was just so soft and he's so powerful, just looking at him, just like, oh, he said, stop wailing. That's what he said. Stop wailing. What are you doing? Stop flailing about over there, for heaven's sake. A new covenant's coming to the house of God. And he goes on to say, she is not dead. Just want you to know. But she's only sleeping. I like this part because I've been reading a lot of Revelation lately at the Laodicean church right before the end of time. And my goodness, don't you agree we're all sleepy? We're all doing our kindness, paying forward a cup of joe. That's our kindness. So we're too sleepy to get out and go interact with someone on higher level of things. And we felt good because we kept the line going 25 people back. Generous family of God. We're sleeping, for heaven's sake, on the mission, on the point, on the real thing. But Jesus wants to say, listen, family of God, come on, brush by me and get your reward. Don't brush by me anymore and not receive the blessing from just the touch of the hem of my garment. You just need to look at me and have faith. Stop being afraid. I know you're afraid, Jarius, church of God, family of God. That's why you're sleeping. Disciples of 12, you're sleeping because you're afraid of the pain of what's about to happen. But I'm telling you, you need to look me in the eye and have faith. And in the name of Jesus, even the lame, to see and sleeping people, Jesus will say to the world, step back, stop wailing for my church. They're just asleep. I'm going to go wake them up. For I'm about ready to give eternal life to these people. They're not dead. They're just sleeping, family of God. I'm excited about that. Wake me up, Lord Jesus, from my lame, to see and way of being. And you know what they did outside when Jesus said that to them? Because they know death when they see death. They started laughing. That wailing crowd just turned off the wail and they started laughing. That would have been a funny change of things. So they're outside laughing and Jesus takes his small tribe inside and he says, because every little girl, he took her by the hand and said, my child, reminds me of the older woman, my daughter, my child, my personal child, get up. That's all he had to say. Just do it. Her spirit returned, her breath returned, and her lifeless body 
And at once she shut up. She stood up and Jesus told them, hurry up and feed this girl. Hurry up and feed her. She hasn't had nourishment. She needs the breath of God and she needs some food in her belly because she's going to live. And he told her parents, who were astonished standing there. Jerry's just had a little bit of relief on him walking over to the house. And I wonder what that means about church going forward, the new covenant. If you open up your Bibles to Hebrews, I encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. For Jesus came. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant that kept flowing blood and flowing blood, but not healing anything and changing anything, then I would not need to come as the Son of God. But chapter 10 in Hebrews says, now the sacrifice has come. And he came and he did once and for all what no one else could do. And he healed his people. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new with the house of Israel, that tribe of twelve that becomes the complete perfect order of all people who will be saved in the 144,000 and it will all happen by faith. So it occurs to me with this story being told that the kind of kindness Jennifer needs to practice is a deeper kind of kindness. And if the lady see sleepy group of people will be awakened from the dead by, by the Son of God if we'll brush by and touch this, grab the hem of his garment, we'll wake up. The Laodicean people will be healed from what we had been afraid of before, and we will go forward with power in a different kind of kindness. When I think of kindness now, it's just a courteous gesture to somebody, but Jesus' kind of kindness was more like this. When I have interchanges with people, my kindness is reciprocal based on how they treat me. And often, I, out of my own woundedness, I get little irritations from other people. Do you? Has anyone bothered you lately? Like, irritated your soul? Lately? Father, help. Yeah, just this week. Come on. I'm not going to make you raise your hands because we don't want to confess all the truth of it. But, when that happens, here's how Jesus' kindness works. He is filled up by his God relationship so much so that it matters not what anybody else does. So his kindness is entirely focused on the salvation of these people around him and not at all worried about the offense against his own soul. Because he doesn't need your kindness to make me who I am. I am not dependent on your kindness to make me loved and daughter and child of God. I am already filled up. We've got to focus on him. We've got to behold him because we are changed. And we become like him. We become filled up. We become healed. Let me tell you, that woman with the stream of blood, she went forward in her life, I have no doubt, unfazed by anybody who tried to bring up the past up in her face because she is a daughter of the king. And she is healed. And there's nothing like normal feeling really good after you've been with that much pain in the past. Normal feels so good and she is lit up. And now kindness is I begin looking at people and I don't give them courteousness. I give them and I hear them and I see them through what they need for God. So if they've offended me, huh, I wonder what the pain is down deep underneath that and what word of God they need to be healed. I wonder what hell of the garment of the story of Christ I can feed them that they might be healed. It's not about me. It's about your salvation. That's true kindness. Come on, people. So Titus says, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, you know what he did? He wasn't offended by all their offensiveness and they were offensive to the Son of God. He saved us. That's what he did. That's what his not because they were righteous and worthy of it. They were not. They were offensive. Not for any goodness they had done, Jarius. You, you were part of the old covenant. It just did, we just need Jesus, period. Because of his mercy, his kindness comes and he saves people. 1 Peter 5.10 says, But God shows undeserved kindness to everyone. Not just reciprocally so. Everyone. That's just how he rolls. Zechariah 7 9 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgment. See, our judgment is related to our level of kindness. 
If I judge your behaviors, I will give according to God's judgment, and true judgment, family of God, if we can wake up from Laodicea, true judgment is the kind that shows kindness and mercy to one another. Because we know that God's judgment already fell on the Son of God once and for all, and no more blood needs to be shed. He came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And when we judge and discern for people, we should see what they cannot yet see by faith for them. You are already forgiven. You are already His. Let me help you see what you can't see. That's kindness. That's kindness. Ephesians 1, 7 says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood We are covered in his blood, and ours need no longer flow. We are to touch the hem of his garment and be launched into the new covenant of Jesus. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. 
Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but be overcome evil with good. Lord, help us take this message. In your name, amen. Yeah.